Well, how, how's everyone this morning? Good? Are you sure? Everyone good this morning? Hey, could we, uh, could we give the worship team just a, a thank you for what they brought us this morning? We're so blessed to be able to worship. Hey, I'm so glad you're here this morning. My name is John. I'm one of the teaching pastors here. Glad you're here, whether you're in service or watching online. As Larissa said, you know, we have this uh, great series we started uh, last weekend called Shift Your Focus, where we're looking at um, how to live a life of joy every day. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to go through the book of Philippians, which is a great book to discover joy. And Scott kicked it off last weekend. And if you missed that message, I would highly encourage you to go back online and watch that because he was talking about how you find joy in uncertain times. And we all face uncertain times and yet just those great sort of reflections and tools of how to find joy in in uncertain times. As we continue today, what I want to talk about is how we find joy through humility. We find joy through humility, and we're going to be in chapter 2 of Philippians, verses 1 through 11, to actually discover that. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along, or the Green Valley app, uh, you certainly can plug in there, and there's the fill-ins and some of the scriptures. But I know what you're thinking, why is that guy talking about humility? He's not, he's not very humble, but uh, I think that's one of those things that we all sort of reflect on about humility, uh, just asking ourselves, so just to show of hands, how many of you are humble? <laughs> That's good. There were some hands in the first service, I'm just saying. So we had to let them know that was a trick question. But, you know, you know humility is a funny thing because it's, it's really great to see it in other people, but it's kind of weird if you start seeing it in yourself, right? I love what Edie Hulse says. He says, humility is a really strange thing. The minute you think you got it, you lost it. <laughs> and it's so true because obviously you don't reflect and go, wow, I've just really become humble. And it's this amazing thing. Truth is, though, humility... Is so important as an evidence of a Christ follower. So much so that next to love in the scriptures, it's the second most mentioned virtue in the scriptures is, is this growth in humility. So humility is extremely important, obviously. But again, also, which is very counterintuitive, we find that when our humility grows, it is actually a path to experiencing more joy in our life. And so today we're going to look at what that, that, that path looks like in terms of growing more humility. And it has a lot to do with where we focus. And that's what we're going to look at today. And I'm going to just leave you with this, start with this big idea. And, and it's simply this, is that we experience joy within ourselves when we take the focus off of ourselves. Now, a couple thoughts about that. We live in a world that that's very counterintuitive because the world tells us to put the focus on yourself, to be successful, to, to get recognition and do all of those things. So, so we kind of go against the own, our culture to say, wow, that, that's not very common to say, hey, it's not about me, it's about other people. But the second thing that we fight when it comes to humility is not just our world and our culture, but we, we, we fight our own selves, Because by nature, we are self-centered people. I don't know if any of you know what a photobomb is. Anybody know what a photobomb is? Urban Dictionary says that photobombs are somebody that ruins a picture by inserting themselves where they don't belong. I don't know if you've seen some photobombs. Here's a couple of examples of people that are inserting themselves where they don't belong. (laughs) Then there's this one. That kid's going to grow up to be pretty selfish, right? Then there's this guy inserting himself in a nice 49er huddle there. (laughs) I promise that's all I'm going to say about the Raiders today. I promise you that. The fact of the matter is, is that self-focus or self-centeredness, self-focus is kind of like a photobomb. And that's because it really is all about us. And so what we find in, this, in, the, in the Bible is there's, there's something very different that says that actually when you don't make it about you is when you really can find joy and contentment in life. I think it's really important for us also to understand when we talk about humility what it is and what it isn't because a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions when it comes to humility. There's actually, which is very true, there was a a, a, a group in the late or the early 20th century that um, committed themselves to living a life of humility and, and meekness, and they were known as doormats. 
Could you not? That was their, their name were doormats, and it stood for the divine order of really meek and timid people. Could you imagine getting recruited to that? Hey, you want to go come join us and become a doormat? <laughs> but, but some people think humility is about being a doormat. And it's not. They think about it as being weak, and they think about it as being sort of this idea of letting people walk all over you. But that is the furthest thing from the truth when it comes to humility, because humility actually comes from a place of strength, and that strength is a confidence in our identity in Christ that weathers any sort of human agenda or people's opinions, including our own. That's what humility is all about. It's a confidence and a strength in that. It's this idea when we take the focus off of ourselves that we live this life that isn't living this life that wants to suck everything into our little story, but getting the focus off of us and becoming part of God's big story and playing a part in that, which is where we find our ultimate purpose, which ultimately leads to incredible joy. So, again, the question becomes... How do we grow in our humility? How do we actually just grow this heart in humility? And that's what I want to look at today in Philippians chapter 2, a little bit about the book. And Paul, it was written by Paul, the Apostle Paul, and it is a, one of the epistle, uh, or excuse me, the prison epistles, where he's writing this from prison. So he's not in good circumstances. He's talking about joy, which is an amazing thing if you think about it. So he's writing it from there. There's a central scripture uh, Philippians 1 21 that, that says, you know, to live is Christ is, and to die is gain. But you can look at those four chapters like a frame about Christ because what, what Paul's main theme is really is this living this life in the gospel leads to a life of joy. And so these frames are really four aspects of this, this focus on Christ and, and, re, and living the gospel out. The first one is, is that Jesus, like the first chapter is really about Jesus is our life. Second chapter is Jesus is our example. Third chapter, you're going to see Jesus is our reward. And then lastly, <clears throat> in the fourth chapter, it's Jesus is enough. And through that whole framework, we're going to be going through this series to figure out different aspects of joy. But in the second chapter, it's amazing because what we find in the second chapter is how we actually grow in humility. And there's three requirements that I want to look at today, and if you're a note taker, you can write these down. But the first one is this, is that to grow in humility, number one, it requires a constant awareness. It requires a constant awareness. Anybody um, play basketball, like playing basketball, good at basketball? Well, not too many people. I'm, I don't feel so bad because I'm terrible at basketball. But if you think about a basketball, what if... <clears throat> what, if it, what if it doesn't have an, enough air in it? What happens to a basketball? It doesn't bounce, right? But then if it has too much air in it, it isn't effective either because it bounces too much. I was terrible in basketball, and he used to say when I'd miss shots, I'd tell my coach, hey, man, there's too much air in the basketball. And then he, <laughs> and he'd remind me, well, you got to hit something for it to actually be the problem. Like, you got to hit the backboard. <clears throat> but, you know, air to a basketball... It's kind of like humility to our egos. We all have an ego. Egos are not bad things. Egos are part of who we are, and they're, they're healthy things when they're in the right proportion. Problem with ego is, is what happens is, is that sometimes when it's underinflated or overinflated, that's where the discrepancy discrepancy starts and humility helps us to keep that balance. And one of the ways that we keep that balance is through constant awareness. Constant awareness of what? It's the constant awareness that no matter what you have, no matter what, you're do what you've done that's a success, no matter what you have as strengths, technical abilities, gifts, talents, acquisitions, whatever that is, that that comes from God and it's not by your own doing. That is the number one and most important thing in the awareness is, hey, this isn't just from my doing. You see, I think it's easy for us to go through life and when we have successes to start thinking about it in a way that this is my abilities and this is the result of my work and not God's work. I know in my life, I mean, God's like all of us have gifted us with some different talents and, and abilities and I was, had some successes at times being in the right place at the right time over the years and I found myself over time starting to think this was done on my own merits and had nothing to do with God. And that's what happens when our egos get overinflated. Somebody said that ego stands for edging God out. 
And I think that's exactly what it is because the more I became successful, the more I thought I don't need God. And if you look at the, the history of the Bible, of the fall of, of, of mankind, humankind, it has to do with edging God out. Look at the fall in the garden. What was that about? You don't need God. You can be your own God. And I know for myself that it's easy for me to get to that place and go through life and go, wow, this is, look at me. This is stuff that I've done on my own. And the important part of staying humble and growing a heart of hum, uh, humbleness is to recognize one thing, that these are all gifts from God and not by our own doing. James says it in James 1.19. He says that all good and perfect gifts come from above. And I guess the question for all of us on this is when we look at those things in our life that God has gifted us with or given to us, is that where we go? Thank you, God, for those gifts you've given me. Or do you, do you go to this place of, wow, look what I was able to do. There's a writer by the name of Richard Rohr. He's an amazing writer, and he, and he writes this book about humility called Falling Upward. And in this book, he writes that for years he would pray every single day this prayer that he would ask God to give him one humiliation every single day. <laughs> Think about that. How would you like to pray that for? Hey, God, humiliate me once every single day, right? And he was saying it wasn't like sadistic or he wanted an insult or embarrassment. What he was saying is, God, humble me every day so I can keep in check that idealized version of myself that I think I am. That's what he's saying. To, to, to reveal to me every single day something that reminds me and I can actually gauge whether I'm actually doing this work for my glory or your glory. And that's a great prayer to pray, oh Lord, humble me. Because if you think about it, that root word for humiliation and humble is the same thing. It's this, this root word is hummus, which means ground or close to the ground. So it's this beautiful prayer that says, God, help me keep my feet close to the ground so I don't get too puffed up or get too low, right? He also tells a story in there about Don Shula, famous football coach, um, you know, one of the most successful coaches in the history of the NFL. And Don Shula used to take vacations up in remote part of Maine during the off season. So one season he went up to this small podunk town in Maine with his wife and five kids. And uh, one day during the week it was raining. They couldn't go outside. They decided to go see a movie. So they go to this movie theater and there's literally six people in this movie theater. Lights were on and people are standing there. He walks in with his family and they, these six people give him a standing ovation. He was like, Whoa. These people even know me up here in these far remote areas. So he sits down with his wife and goes, well, you know, it feels pretty good that you can go anywhere in this country, even to the far corners, and people know who you are. So as he sat down feeling pretty good about himself, this guy comes walking up to him to shake his hand. And the guy goes, hey, man, thank you so much for being here. And Shula responds to him and says, well, no problem. You know, I didn't know you knew who I was way up here. And the man responded and he says, mister, I don't know who you are. I just know that right before you got here, the theater manager said, if five more people don't show up, we're canceling the movie this afternoon. <laughs> Lord, humble me. <laughs> Bring me down to earth, God. <laughs> you know, think about it. Think about, in a bigger sense, our human condition without God. Think about that. Think about the fact that, you know, we all fall short of God's glory and sin separated us from God and we couldn't come back to God, but yet God loved us so much that he sent his son. You talk about the ultimate in humility to live a life that we could never live, to die a death we deserve to die and to rise again so we can have eternal life, even when we rejected him. The question is, do you appreciate that daily? Are you aware of it? Daily, that constant awareness. Is it there for you, or do you just take it for granted? I mean, if I'm honest about myself, I go, I go through life a lot of times just taking that for granted, and then it's just reminded every now and then. You know, Gypsy Smith, this great preacher of the 19th century, said it really well because he's, he was asked in the late, uh, in late in his life, in his late 80s, um, they asked him, how did you stay so passionate and on fire for God. And he said, the reason I, the way I did it is I never lost the wonder of it all. <clears throat> and I think the question for all of us is, have we lost 
the wonder of it all. You know, Paul talks in in chapter 1 about living a life worthy of the gospel. And then he goes on in chapter 2 starting and he continues that thought of of this idea of living worthy of the gospel. And this is what he says. He says, therefore, if if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. What Paul is saying here, friends, is this, is that if you are affected by the grace and love that God poured out on you, then pour it out to others in your life. That's what he's saying. And one of the amazing byproducts of this life of awareness of God's amazing love and grace is humility. And one of the byproducts of humility he shows right here is unity with one another. And we're going to talk about that a few weeks down the road about how we find joy in unity. But it's humility that we see everybody on the same level because we know we all needed saving. That's how we do it when he says to have a like mind and and one heart and one spirit and one love. It's all centered around the one that none of us can do without. So the question again is, do you live in constant awareness and wonder of what God has done for you? I love what Timothy Keller says about this. I'll end this point with this quote, but he has a great quote about the gospel. And this is is what he says. He says, the Christian gospel is that I am so flawed that Jesus had to die for me, yet I am so loved and valued that Jesus was glad to die for me. This leads to a deep humility and deep confidence at the same time. It undermines both swaggering and sniveling. I cannot feel superior to anyone, and yet I have nothing to prove to anyone. I just want to stop right there in that. You want to find joy in your life? Live with not having to prove anything to anyone because we have to chase finish lines all the time, and we don't have to in Christ because it's finished. Then he goes on to say, I do not think more of myself nor less of myself. Instead, I just think of myself less. You want to have more humility in your life, friends. The first is that just to have that constant awareness of our dependency on God. The second one is to have a change of attitude. To have a change of attitude. How many of you like math? You know math people? Wow. Hey, I just want to say to you guys, you're sick. No. No, you're not. I actually don't mind math. I'm okay at it. But it just, it just never was my thing, if you will, in terms of math. And that comment just right there, it never, was never really my thing. It's an interesting comment because what I didn't realize I was saying with that is I was operating, I was showing evidence of operating would, from a place what's known as a fixed mindset. When I said, I'm not really too good at this. And there's a psychologist, uh, Christina uh, Dworth, who actually did some study on this. And what they found was is that when people are faced with challenges, good or bad, to change they do that from, they operate from two, one of two mindsets, either a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. Fixed mindsets are just, here's my, here's who I am, here's my intellect, here's my abilities, here's who I am, it's never going to change, and this is my, this is me. Growth mindset obviously is the opposite of that, that says, hey, I can change, and I can morph, and I can grow and learn new things. And she played this out in this this whole math research starting in seventh grade, and they followed these students starting in seventh grade with math, and what they found is all of those, those kids that started with this fixed mindset that this is just who they are didn't excel in math. But all these other individuals that went in with a growth mindset did very, very well, far beyond what even they thought they could do, all because of this growth mindset. And the point of this is it's the same with growing humility in our lives. Is the fact of the matter is, is that we have to, if we really believe we can do this, we have to do this with a growth mindset. Because if we come in with this fixed way, uh, this is always who I am, I'll never grow in this, the chances are, I'll save you the suspense, you're probably not going to grow in humility. You see, the fact of the matter is, if you look at spiritual growth, one of the biggest evidences of spiritual maturity and growth in our life is humility. 
One of the biggest evidences of spiritual immaturity is pride and self-centeredness. I mean, we think about kids. Any of you that are parents here, when you have young kids, I think it's pretty safe to say that they're pretty self-centered when they're young. As they, as they grow up, your hope as you raise your kid is, kids is that they become more outward-focused and less inward-focused, and your goal is to do that, and it's no different in our Christian walk, is that God's plan and hope for us is that we grow in maturity from being self-centered and prideful to more humble. I mean, I think about my kids in my life. When, I, when my kids were teenagers, I mean, God bless them. They're, they're older now and great, but when they, were young, when they were younger, they were pretty self-centered. And so anytime, I, I very rarely heard something like, hey, Dad, how are you today? <laughs> and if I did hear that, there was one of three statements that would come after that. Can I borrow the car? Can I stay out later tonight? Do you have any money? And your hope is that you grow and grow and be, they, become more spiritual, they become more mature as adults. And the same with our spiritual life. I don't know if you've ever, done, when you were growing up, or if you maybe still do it now with some of the kids, where you have these marks that you put on the wall where you kind of measure height of like how you're getting taller you know, over time. I did that when we were young. My brother and I would do that. My parents wouldn't let us scratch into the wall, so they'd put tape with a pencil mark, right? And my brother, who is just always messing with me and he would when I'm not around he would just keep changing that that tape and keep moving it up where it looked like I never was growing so every time I stood there I was in the same distance from that line and I really thought I was going to be like four feet tall for the rest of my life right (laughs) so in this text Paul actually gives us sort of a measurement of growth for us in our sort of spiritual development, and he does that in verses three and four. And look at what the litmus test is for just us growing in, you know, to become more spiritually mature. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Right here in this text, in these two verses, Paul is giving us sort of a a measuring stick in terms of how we're doing, in terms of growing from sort of a selfish pride and maturity to more of a humble maturity. And let me just put these questions up here just in translating that because it enables us to have that same sort of test. First one is, do I value my relationships mostly for how they benefit me? Do I talk more than I listen? I mean, this is a big one for me. It's like, am I, do, do you have a tendency when you sit with somebody, are you listening more than talking, or do you have to be the one talking? Are my opinions the most important to express? Do I think everybody has to hear my opinions, and I don't give a hoot about somebody else's? Do I need to be recognized for everything that I do well? Ugh, that's a big one, huh? Have you ever been in a meeting or on a job where you're in a group of people, you had an idea and somebody else took credit for it and you're sitting there and trying to figure out ways to take, you know, without just blatantly go, hey, that was actually my idea. That's a hard one. And do I celebrate the success of others or does it make me jealous and competitive? See, what Paul's saying here, and this isn't to beat ourselves up, this is to take an honest inventory of where we are by standing against the wall and go, am I growing or am I stagnant, you know? And if for some of us, it's like, hey, we're, nobody's perfect and we're going to always struggle with those issues because we're human, but if there's this regular pattern in our lives that says, wow, I'm just staying in the same place, what Paul here is saying, I want to challenge you to grow. And you can have a growth mindset that this isn't all, this isn't the place you're always going to be. You can actually grow. And then he does something really, really wild is that he gives us that standard and raises the height of where we can actually grow to in verse 5. Look what it says. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Wow. That's a pretty high bar. I mean, I don't know about you, but it's like I'm thinking to myself when I read that, hey, could we start with just a human, maybe a little bit lower down the ladder a little bit, maybe Mother Teresa or something like that? We're up here with Jesus right off the bat. 
Well, there's a reason for that, that Paul raises the bar so high, and that is this, is that this change and transformation of attitude has nothing to do with a self-help of just the power of positive thinking or behavioral modification. This kind of transformation he's talking about only comes from the power of the Spirit living in us, doing the work from the inside out. That, that is the only way that this happens. We have a role in it, but this isn't us being able to just pull ourselves up by the bootstraps to go, well, I'm just going to work and become more humble. See, the promise is this, is that, that when Christ enters into our life, God imparts his spirit into us and starts the work of actually transforming us more and more into the image of Christ. And, what, and those growth opportunities coming from our ability and openness to allow God to do that in our lives. In fact, Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians. He explains this a little bit or reiterates it, I should say, in the text. He says, so all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. This sort of transformation and growth mindset is one that says, I got the power and the spirit in me, and anything is possible, and God can change me and grow me. It's not about our own doing. My parents, I've told this story before, but my parents, so this year my parents are going to have been married 68 years, which is amazing to me. Isn't that awesome? I know. I just, I love that. I'm just, it actually makes me feel old, so, and I'm, I'm the kid, so. Anyway, my dad, uh, true story, my dad, grew, they grew up in, a, in a, cent, a town in Central Valley in Selma, raising capital of the world, and so they were high school sweethearts, so they were together since they were like sophomore year in high school. My dad played football. He was the third string running back on the Selma Bears football team, which, you know, means you're not very good when you're third string, and that's where I got my abilities from as well, but... <laughs> Anyway, never played on the team, so one Friday night during the thing, he's like, they never put me in, so he just decided not to go to the game, and he just went cruising with my mom in town. They just were like, hey, we're going to go on a date. They never, never used me. Well, just luck would have it that he's gone, that the first string and second string running backs both got hurt, so they needed him, and he's not there. So they pulled a guy from the defense, and, that, and he had to wear my dad's shirt because of number coordination or whatever, so he wears my dad's shirt with my dad's name, and the dude killed it. He had like, he scored like three times and he did, broke all these records for, for yardage and all of this stuff. And all the while, everybody thought it was my dad doing it. So my, so my dad's driving around listening to the radio, hearing his name called like three different times. Touchdown, Loera! Touchdown, Loera! I mean, we joke because my dad's best game was the one he wasn't there. <laughs> Think about that. At one point, he says, when he's listening to the radio, the guy, the guy that's announcing the game there goes, man, I don't know what happened to Loera, but he's like a different person there. <laughs> and he seems taller. <laughs> My dad laughs because he said for weeks, these guys were coming up to him, and, and people didn't know it there. And they had to, he had to keep telling people, it wasn't me. It was somebody else. It wasn't me. They were just wearing my uniform. Here's the point. How cool would it be, though, when God does the work in us that somebody comes up to you or I and to say, what is it about you? Well, you're like a different person. You seem like you're more humble. And you can say, it's not me. It's about the person in me. For you that have parents and, and with kids, have you, ever, have you ever looked at your kid and seen something that reminds you of yourself and your kid that just brings emotion to you where you see this thing and you go, wow, that's, that's, that just reminds me of me. You ever do that? You ever have that feeling? When God sees himself in us, that's the feeling that he has. When he sees that growth in us, that's the feeling he has. In fact, it says it in the scriptures in James that God exalts the humble. So the question on this one about change of attitude is just simply this. As you look at your life and growing, do you, grow, do you, do you approach it from a, from a fixed mindset or a growth mindset? Last one is this, is that obviously to grow in humility that we have to have this constant awareness of our dependency on God. And we have to have this, this it requires this change of attitude that only God can do. And then the last one is just to be committed to action. It's just to committed to action. Simply that. And Jesus in this text shows us exactly what that action looked like. And it's two things really quickly. The first one is this. is Jesus is a model of a servant. 
Jesus first is a model of a servant. It says in verse 7, it says, rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. I mean, you don't have to guess about how Jesus calls us to live because right before he went to the cross, he washed his disciples' feet. It was one of the most low of low things to do. And he also said, then do this with one another. So we don't have to guess on that. But the power of serving is incredible because if, if, and if you serve, you know what I mean. But serving does humble us because it gets us out of ourselves. It gives us a perspective of other people. It breaks down our stereotypes. I mean, the list goes on and on what it actually does for us to kind of humble us in terms of the places we are. Nicole was talking about the mission uh, trips and I remember the first mission trip that I went on, where I was in Mexico and experiencing this 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 poverty and the dumps of Tijuana, where where these kids and these families had nothing. And I remember the first time I came back to the United States and being in a grocery store and just being overwhelmed in terms of things that I've taken a grant for granted all of my life, all the choices there that some people don't have. And I was just overwhelmed with this. I was humbled by it, literally, in terms of, I take all this for granted. I was at Common Ground this last Saturday, um, and there was a woman serving there who's going through a really, really difficult time, and she came and served at Common Ground. I was having a conversation with her after, and she was pretty emotional, and she said, you know what, I've been inside my own head for months and going, and she connected with a couple of people who were going through some pretty tough stuff, and she said, you know what? I needed to get out of my head and start to focus on other people so I can actually sort of be humbled by this. I mean, we had our youth there yesterday. We had our Larissa with the high schoolers serving there. You know, we were saying earlier how we want to have, you know, get our kids to have sort of a grow empathy and to kind of get outside of themselves. That's the way to do it is through serving is to help to grow our humility, I mean, I was at the clothes closet yesterday, which I, I tell you, every time I go there and I go into the clothes closet, it blows me away, this, this amazing place that gives dignity to people where you're going into this room like you're literally shopping and everything's laid out so perfectly. And what people forget about that, I know I do, and it, made, it dawned on me yesterday, is what it takes to make Saturday happen is this small group of people that every Tuesday and Thursday are showing up down in that clothes closet, going through thousands upon thousands of clothes, folding, sorting, you know, getting rid of the bad stuff, putting it out there every single week, 52 weeks a year, and they're unsung heroes. Can we give them a hand? That's humility. They would never ask for a limelight, but they're making that happen behind the scenes. And on a side note of that, just real quickly, you know, if we have this need for men's clothing right now, and if you, if you um, can donate some men's clothing, shirts, pants, you know, socks, shoes, underwear, whatever it is, if you can donate, we could use it because we want to be caring for our men and women in the community. So just please make a side note of that. And then the last one is this. The other thing that, Je- that Jesus modeled is he was a model of obedience. He was just a model of obedience. It goes on to say, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's an amazing thought right there because obedience is hard. But it's the greatest key to humbling ourselves is to be obedient to God. John Maxwell says it, and it's so true, that most Christians are educated way beyond their level of obedience. And I think that's so true because it's easy. We know what to do. It's actually doing it that's the difficult part. But obedience is is difficult, friends, but it's everything when it comes to us actually experiencing humility and joy in our life. Because the minute that we actually uh, uh, become obedient to God and fall under his loving rule is when we get out of the way to give him the opportunity to do the work in us. You want more joy, you want more patience, you want more kindness, you you want more strength, you want more perseverance, you want more contentment, then then put yourself under God's loving rule, and he promises he will do that work in us. There's no other way to do it. I think about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was considered by Jesus himself the greatest. Jesus used those words, he was the greatest. I don't know about you, but if you get called the greatest by Jesus, I think it'd be hard not to get puffed up about that, right? Right? But you know, when Jesus started to gain followers and John started to lose followers and they, his followers went to John and they asked him, hey, John, these people are going over to Jesus. Jesus uh, John's words were some of the most important words, I think, in the scriptures. And I think they're the most important words for us 
I, I would, I, it's, it's one of my life verses, but John's response to his disciples about people going to Jesus, John 3.30, what does he say? He says, he must increase and I must decrease. If you want to get, have a game changer in your life in God and obedience, pray that prayer. He must increase and I must decrease. God, more of you, less of me, you know? See, God wants all of us. When we talk about obedience and humility, it's like he doesn't want small parts of us or certain parts but not these other areas of my life. He wants everything. And that prayer is a game changer. God, more of you, less of me. So the question here for you, friends, is is there a place in your life that you need to pray that prayer? Maybe it's in your marriage. God, more of you and less of me. Maybe it's in your job. Maybe your job is, has become almost like your identity and your career is just something that defines you. And maybe it's that prayer, God, more of you and less of me. Maybe it's your finances. God, more of you and less of me. Or your time. Or maybe you're struggling with pride and ego. God, I know I do. More of you, less of me. I can tell you this. If we pray that prayer, it'll change your life. Two types of humility in this text, friends. There's the humility that comes with one another, you and I in relationship, and then there's also the humility between us humbling to God. And I can tell you this, we cannot have this in relationships and humility without doing this first. God, more of you and less of me. Last story, so many of you know Corey, who Corey Ten Boom is, and she wrote The Hiding Place, and she was in, um, living in the Netherlands with her family during World War II when not the Nazis, Germany, was uh, occupying there. And she wasn't Jewish, but they, her family decided to protect the Jews and hide them so they wouldn't be caught and put to, into the concentration, concentration camps. And she did this, and their family did this at the expense of their own safety. They were arrested, and they themselves were put in Ravensbrück, her and her, her, and her uh, sister and her father. And they survived it, but they were brutalized there during that time. And as she got out, when she got out of Ravensbrook, she went on to this amazing journey of forgiveness. And she forgived the guards that actually brutalized her. She shared that forgiveness and she expressed the power of God in her life to the degree that she brought countless people to Christ from her testimony in her heart. Toward the end of her life, after one of her testimonies, somebody came up to her because she came, became so iconic and asked her the question, Corey, how do you stay so humble with all the success that you have? And this was her response. It's my favorite response from her. She said, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on the back of a donkey and everyone was waving palm branches and throwing garments onto the road and singing praises, do you think that for one moment it ever entered the head of that donkey that any of that praise was for him? (laughs) If I can be the donkey on which Jesus Christ rides in his glory, I give him all the praise and all the honor. Isn't that awesome? Friends, when we humble ourselves to God, we also get to be and play a part of bringing Jesus into his glory. And this is what Paul says at the end of this, that glory is going to look like. He says, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Amen to that, right.